Thank you, Norm. Stephen, thank you for uh, just some fascinating insights. We really appreciate that. It gives me great pleasure to bring up the next uh, panel, uh, moderator Brad Geyer and his four panelists. Uh, we're bringing it down to home now, uh, talk about San Diego and uh, the insights that we will get from part of the reaction to what they've heard earlier, I'm sure. Uh, I just want to remind you, at the conclusion of the this panel, I'm going to have a quick drawing for a uh, certificate for our continuing education program. It's worth $450. If you haven't already turned in your business card, I've got a little bowl over there. You're welcome to do that before we have the drawing at the end of the program. Brad. Thank you, Mark. Uh, it's my privilege to moderate uh, phase two or part two of uh, uh, the panel, Shape of Things to Come. Uh, we heard earlier this morning from uh, a group of capital markets experts, uh, and uh, Kent Griffin, I think, used uh, uh, some movie analogies. And uh, I'm not sure I would select the same uh, choices that he did. I think we're probably somewhere between up in the air and it's complicated. <laughs> Hopefully not gone with the wind. But uh, this group uh, of uh, industry leaders uh, from San Diego uh, bring a different perspective, I think. Uh, they're active uh, in, the, in the trenches uh, as investors, as developers. Uh, we even have a receiver. Uh, on the panel, and uh, it, it will be interesting to hear their, uh, uh, their insights, their perspectives on uh, how our current economic environment is reshaping uh, the real estate industry, how they've chosen to position themselves, uh, and where they see the opportunities uh, going forward. Uh, as, been, as been mentioned uh, previously, the bios for all the speakers are in your program, but let me uh, just give a brief uh, introduction of uh, each of these four uh, gentlemen, and then we'll let each of them speak for uh, a few minutes, and, uh, and then we're going to try and make this as interactive uh, as we can, make sure you guys are awake uh, out there. Um, first, uh, on my immediate left is uh, Dean Oliver. Uh, Dean uh, co-founded uh, with his partner Jim McMillan, Oliver McMillan, uh, about 30 years ago, and uh, he has been a, uh, uh, an active uh, developer of all different product types, including office, retail, residential, and perhaps uh, he's best known for uh, his innovative uh, urban uh, mixed-use uh, projects. And uh, he's certainly been a, uh, a strong uh, civic leader and uh, supporter of San Diego, so we're pleased to have you, Dean. Um, next, on Dean's left, uh, is Greg Fitchett. Greg is the Vice President of Development for Westfield. Uh, Westfield, as I think most of you know, is, uh, uh, if not the largest, uh, certainly one of the largest regional mall uh, developers and owners in the world. Uh, and uh, locally, they have a number of properties. Most recently, uh, Greg has been involved uh, in spearheading the uh, entitlements for the planned uh, billion dollar uh, addition and redevelopment of uh, UTC. Uh, next to Greg is Bill Hoffman. Bill is the uh, CEO of uh, TriGuild. Uh, it's a firm that he formed uh, over 30 years ago. Uh, and he is a uh, court appointed receiver. So he brings a, a very different perspective uh, to uh, our current environment. Uh, Bill's been involved in over 1,500 uh, receiver assignments uh, in hotels, in, in shopping centers, office buildings, restaurants, uh, you name it. Happy to have Bill. And uh, finally, Stuart Tans, um, last but not least. Stuart uh, is now running uh, a newly formed um, publicly traded REIT uh, called Retail Opportunity Investment Corp. And uh, they focus on uh, the acquisition and ownership uh, management of neighborhood shopping centers on both the east and the west coast. Most of you know Stuart from uh, uh, 
uh, his uh, time in leadership as the CEO of Pan Pacific, which he uh, successfully sold to Kimco at the very top of the market. So, <laughs> so uh, if we could, I'm going to ask uh, Bill Hoffman to kind of lead off and uh, give us some of his insights. We'll kind of go uh, across the table and then, uh, and then we'll have some, uh, some dialogue and some questions from the audience. So, Bill? first, I guess, and uh, it'll improve as we go along, I hope. Um, and I'm probably the one in the room who's got the biggest smile going in, in this economy, so I apologize for sounding like we're the undertaker. I like to think of myself more as, uh, as a paramedic. You really don't ever want to see us, but uh, when you need us, you're glad that we're there. So I spent most of uh, the last few years talking to CMBS servicers, um, and we're fortunate enough to talk to them often enough that a couple of years ago when uh, their losses were down below 1% on commercial debt. Um, I, I had some of those friends from the banking industry coming up to me saying, Bill, you better start gearing up because you're going to get, we're going to get busy. Um, I, I uh, jokingly and probably rudely said, well, if you're at 1%, you've made all the good loans, <clears throat> so you're going to start making the bad loans, I assume, and it will get a little better for us. Uh, I'm particularly interested in, in uh, looking at hotels as a discussion point. Years ago, I used to say hotels are not real estate. Now I guess I'll say they are real estate. Uh, I, I particularly think it's interesting to look at what's happening in the hotel business. I'll come back to it in just a second. But you've got an interesting mix of, of uh, typical real estate to some extent, and then you've got an enterprise value there as well. Uh, the other thing being that hotels react almost on a daily basis. Uh, in the hotel business, we don't like to talk about a vacancy factor. We prefer to call it occupancy. Uh, uh, the, the net is the same, however. Uh, hotels, I, I think, also are probably going to be the biggest uh, disaster is too strong a word. They're going to be the biggest problem in real estate this coming year, I believe. We'll see a bigger drop in hotels and more problems in hotels than uh, we have seen previously, uh, and more so than most of the other commercial real estate. Uh, as I mentioned, we'd, we'd uh, work with a lot of CMBS special servicers. Uh, I don't recall the exact numbers, but I think probably in 2007 we were 200 to 300 billion in CMBS issuance. I think two, 2008, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, 2008 I think was about 12 billion. And I've heard a rumor that in 2009 there was one issuance. I don't, I don't know what that was, and it may be true, but as far as I know there weren't any. That's somewhat of an indication of where we're going. Uh, somebody mentioned earlier about uh, what happens with CMBS. I, I, it seems to me it has to survive because there's no other option that I've heard about yet. And I've asked that question of servicers around the country. Um, I, I, I also believe it will survive. Uh, and I think that may still be a very substantial part of uh, the debt for commercial real estate. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. One of the biggest changes that we've seen uh, just in the last six to nine months was some change in the rules regarding uh, CMBS, basically loosening up uh, the rules for loan modification and making it somewhat easier for uh, CMBS to modify loans. The thing we have seen so far, however, is those modifications are done for the next buyer. They're not being done for the existing buyer. So there is a mechanism by which, and it's too complicated for me to understand, but there is a mechanism by which they essentially restructure the existing loan and then allow the new buyer to assume it. I haven't yet seen or heard about uh, modifications, CMBS modifications, uh, for existing borrowers. Uh, in many cases, I, I, I think uh, servicers and lenders just don't like to see uh, loans written down for defaulting borrowers. The subject of default, uh, I, I think one of the reasons we're going to see this uh, semi-disaster in hotels and even more so in condo hotels uh, the issue with hotels is really not defaults on the payments. The issue with hotels are, are all of this debt that was issued over the last few years that's coming to maturity, and it's just impossible to refinance that because there's no equity there. And In fact, um, the property values are substantially below the debt on most hotels. To give you some idea of the scope, uh, best estimates I've heard are there are between five and 600 hotels in default just in California, and uh, it seems to me that uh, when we go from a couple calls a month to uh, eight to ten calls a week, that's an indicator of what's coming. Most of those have not been addressed yet, which, which I believe uh, is why um, you hear people that don't sound quite as pessimistic as I do. I was at a hotel conference in this hotel at the beginning of this week, and it had, I won't say upbeat, but it didn't have a frightened 
uh, tone. I, I believe they're wrong. I you know, hate to say negative things, but I think they're wrong. And the main reason is because the public uh, it really hasn't, hasn't heard about hotel defaults. They've only addressed a very small portion of those properties that are in default or uh, imminent default. So I think we'll see uh, that'll be the most visible in the coming year. And I was asked to be brief, and those of you who know me, both of you, know that I'm rarely brief, so I'm proud of myself. Well, before we move on, uh, what about other asset classes, though, Bill, besides uh, hotels in terms of, you know, what's, what's the next uh, uh, largest property group that's at risk, and, and uh, what, what kind of velocity do you see? It, it seems the, like, and I, I don't know that we, one company, is a measure of that, but it seems to me that retail continues to be uh, a problem and uh, hasn't gone away or hasn't improved yet. And I think for all classes, by the way, to sound really pessimistic, I think for all classes, um, I don't believe we're at the bottom. I think we'll get to the bottom fairly soon, but more importantly, I think we'll remain at the bottom for quite some time. Uh, Stuart, that's probably a good, uh, good lead into uh, to your portion here. Excuse me, thanks for having me here on the panel today. It's great to be back in San Diego after spending time back in New York over the last three or four months. I'm beginning to warm up. In any case, I wanted to start off just talking about the capital markets. Um, you know, when you look at the public markets today, REITs are being valued, uh, are being, uh, have a higher valuation than the private market. And that has provided, in my view, some great opportunity to come, to come to the public mar markets in terms of accessing both equity and debt capital. Uh, when you look at the 2004 to 2008 period, 52 public companies either went private or, went, or got bought out, like, like Pan Pacific. So a lot of companies disappeared, and that's when the private valuations were higher than the uh, the public valuations, but now the table is turned. With the public valuations a lot higher than the private valuations, there is a, a new sense of being able to go down to Wall Street and really raise three types of different vehicles in terms of raising capital. The first vehicle is the IPO, the traditional IPO, and that's where you have a company or a, a company that's got lots of real estate but a balance sheet that is over leveraged. The advantage of going to the public markets is being able to delever that balance sheet and by delevering the balance sheet with your management team, you're able then to grow, diversify, and continue with your business plan. The second, um, the second type of vehicle that is now occurring on Wall Street is what's called a blind pool of capital something close to my heart because I'm probably, I can sit, sit up here and smile because I just finished going through a process of converting a SPAC, SPAC, which is Special Purpose Acquisition Corporation, and what that was is a pool of capital that was sitting there that I was able to convert to a retail re. The advantage of having a blind pool of capital is today, we are sitting on $400 million of cash and no assets. And that's probably why I'm smiling a bit uh, versus not having to deal with the legacy issues of owning and operating real estate in today's market. The third place that I believe is going to, you'll see a big transition in terms of moving into the public markets is the non-traded REITs. I'm sure most of you are familiar with a lot of these REITs. Um, there's lots of them and have been lots of them over the years. And we are beginning to see a transition of these assets into the public market, uh, starting out with one of the biggest deals that is now on the street, which I'm sure you've heard of as Wells, who had developed a very large office portfolio around the country. And they are currently have filed to take their company public. So these three vehicles are moving a lot of, uh, giving the ability for management teams, and for companies to move into the public markets, and I think that is very positive for the industry. It's positive for the industry because they'll be able to, you'll be able to have a lot more transparency in terms of what's going on in the various sectors and various industries, and more importantly, will give these new companies the ability to compete with the other REITs and also the ability to go out and buy real estate in the marketplace, which I think will 
well, one of the reasons why you'll see more transactions this year is because of all this, all this activity that is going on in the public markets. The shopping center business, um, it's, I, I still love the business. I have a lot of passion for it. Um, I will tell you that it is, it is certainly uh, not as easy today as it was three years ago. But more importantly, what I like about the retail industry is the fact that it is highly fragmented. And for companies out there that are looking at retail or looking at the ability to go out and build a retail portfolio, the opportunity, in my view, really is tremendous because let's take just the west coast of the country. There are 4,000 shopping centers on the west coast. Out of the 4,000 shopping centers, only 6% are owned by the public companies. So it continues to be a very highly fragmented uh, industry or sector, and more importantly, it provides lots of opportunity in terms of going out and growing that segment of your business. In terms of retail, um, you know, when you look back over the last couple of years, retail has certainly had its challenges. Uh, the net operating income at the property level has been very challenging. You, we've seen mostly roll down in terms of rents on leases that have expired or vacancies. Uh, external growth has been a bit difficult given how constrained the market, capital markets have been. Uh, the good news there is that I believe we're going to begin to see more activity. Uh, and on the other hand, from the development side of the business, uh, that will continue to pose some challenge to the public companies because a lot of the public companies had a huge pipeline of development coming into the recession. Um, for us, we are very active buyers today in the market, and Brad wanted me just to make a quick, quick overview in terms of opportunities and where we're seeing the opportunities and how we're sourcing those opportunities. Uh, we have bought two shopping centers over the last 60 days. We're closing on another two next week. Uh, we're probably one of the most active buyers today in the marketplace, and what we're finding is that we're able to source transactions uh, through a number of different sources. Number one, we are looking at uh, going to the institutions, and the institutions out there have some of the best properties and are under a lot of pressure in terms of doing something with these properties. Uh, we're also, even though the distressed side of the business uh, we haven't yet seen a flood of, of distressed uh, real estate. One thing that we're doing is knowing that the borrower has the best relationship to do a transaction, we are actually going to the borrower and working with them to buy a transaction versus going to the lender, and that's proved to be very beneficial in terms of sourcing some very good transactions. More importantly, what we have found is that the sellers out there are quite stressed, and most of the sellers put up their personal balance sheets over the last five years in building their portfolios, and that these balance sheets do have a lot of stress, and whether it's credit lines or other things, the banks are currently calling those credit lines, and that is putting additional pressure on sellers to sell assets very quickly, and what we're finding is if you can come in and pay cash, they're willing to give a 10 to 15% discount. In terms of the tenant market, um, quite challenging. Uh, from the tenant, it's now a tenant's market rather than a landlord's market. What we have found is that tenants really today have a lot of choice. And rather than going out and building new locations, they've been able to really get the pick of a lot of vacancy in the various submarkets around the country and have the ability to walk in and really upgrade their locations, which is something they were not able to do for many, many years. So tenants today certainly have the upper hand. They, ha they are getting better locations. Their prototypes are becoming much more precise in terms of their own business plans. They, uh, so they're operating a lot more efficient, efficiently and more importantly in better locations than in the past. So what does that mean going forward for the tenant base? Well, that means that, in my view, retailers will continue to will, will get healthier but they could get healthier at a much quicker pace because not only are their occup occupancy costs lower, but they're in better locations. And the last thing before I pass it on is that I just wanted to um, 
uh, talk about the other various product types within retail. Um, you know, the big star of this recession is the outlet center. And for many years, the outlet center was a place that, that owners, analysts, many people did not like because the customer realized that the merchandise that was being sold at the outlet center was actually what you were paying for. That actually has turned out to be very, a very favorable format in this environment. Uh, in fact, sales at outlet centers are up as much as 15 or 20 percent when, oh, year over year, and is certainly the star of the retail industry right now. Strip centers, occupancy continues to, occupancy has dropped about five to 600 basis points. Uh, a lot of landlords are giving up rent in terms of holding their occupancy, uh, but the good news there is that we're starting, the rent relief is gone, and we're starting to see the bottom in terms of a loss of tenant, and in some cases, even roll down in rent. The regional mall business uh, continues to do well. Uh, the only issue there, certainly from my perspective, is percentage rent with the loss of sales, but all in all, uh, the consumer continues to shop in that format, and more importantly, the occupancy continues to hold very well. We, uh, we heard lifestyle center. I think that's the, the one part of the business that was invented, that now has to be reinvented. Uh, I have seen a lot of lifestyle centers uh, on the market and been quite astonished in terms of uh, what price you could buy these at, but the problem with the format is how you fix it. Uh, and the co-tenancy provisions and the, the certain clauses that are in these leases that really impact the overall stability of the NOI and more importantly, the value long-term. Thank you. So do you agree with, uh, with Sam that uh, those should be converted to churches? Uh, I would tell you that he's probably not that far off. <laughs> Let's get a uh, perspective on the regional mall business from, uh, from Greg. Thank you. Um, yeah, I've heard uh, some good things about uh, the business that I'm in uh, you know, today. Uh, Sam Zell was, you know, he was very positive about uh, the, the regional mall shopping center is within the segment of retail, as was, was Stuart right now. So that's encouraging to me. Um, what's not encouraging is the fact that I'm a developer and, uh, you know, I, apparently I'm supposed to go to medical school now. So, um, you know, in development, the world of development has changed, you know, 180 degrees since uh, two years ago when I was working on the UTC project. We had been working on it for seven years. We finally got it approved, and we were ready to, to uh, you know, put the shovels in the ground, and then the economy fell apart. So you know, that world where we're taking a, a million square foot mall and turning it into a 1.8 million square foot mall, that's not happening right now. So my, my job has completely changed. It's now about redeveloping uh, the existing assets that we've got. And um, you know, it's, it's more about fixing, fixing the, uh, the centers that we have now and, and the vacancies within those. Um, again, you know, a few years ago, it was great to have an empty department store or two because that meant you had an opportunity. If you could control that re real estate, you could redevelop it as part of a bigger expansion. Uh, that's not so much anymore. We're not really going to be adding square footage uh, to most of the centers where we had planned to a few years ago. Um, and then the retail world, you know, in terms of the tenant universe, is, is, is shrinking. Uh, consumer demand is down. Uh, the traditional mainstays of the mall, like uh, you know the, the fashion retailers, the apparel, the jeweler, and the luxury goods, um, that stuff has all been hit the hardest. And the sectors that are actually performing well are things more like the discounters, uh, the electronics, um, uh, fitness, grocery. In fact, a lot of the uses that kind of got pushed out of the mall over the past three decades. Uh, the mall business is interesting. It really is. It's kind of grown with the, um, uh, with the consumer culture in the U.S. You know, before World War II, uh, the, uh, the, the consumer, you know, the, the amount of product that was out there was very constrained product in terms of consumer products. And since the 50s, we've just seen a continual um, increase in, in kind of the amount of stuff, as, uh, as, as the professor was talking about um, just before. And I think we've we probably peaked out on that. Uh, this last decade was the le decade that was really driven, uh, or the retail industry was driven by the luxury sector, and everybody wanted to have, a, you know, everybody wanted to have a, a you know, a, a two thousand dollar suit or a twelve hundred dollar handbag, and and thought they could, and in fact, uh, with home equity loans and with a very easy credit, um, everybody could get that. 
And that drove the retail industry over the past 10 years in terms of design, in terms of store architecture, in terms of product and marketing, and in terms of rent levels. And that, I think, it's pretty safe to say is over. Luxury is going to return to uh, the, the, uh, the segment that it used to serve, which is you know, the people who are, who are truly wealthy, not kind of everybody who's aspiring to be there. So if, that, if the luxury is no longer going to be the driver of, of the retail business, um, what is going to be? And I think there's, there's two themes that I would say. Uh, one is the idea of value. Um, and value isn't just about price. You know, there's, a, there's an old saying about how uh, uh, you know, rich people are the only ones who can afford to buy cheap clothes because poor people need to buy something that lasts. And that really speaks to this idea of price versus value. Um, you know, value, you know, the people who really understand value in the retail world are people like uh, Target, um, people like uh, uh, J. Crew and Aeropostale, um, Anne Fontaine, and, and you know, internationally companies like Uniqlo. And they're really making a different proposition uh, that I think is going to be very powerful in driving you know, the, the different aspects of retail, whether it's you know, design and, and uh, you know, their merchandising going forward, and they'll be more successful. The other idea, uh, the other concept is story. And what I mean by story is that it's becoming increasingly uh, important to people, I think, uh, the story behind the product. It's no longer just about the product, it's also about the backstory. You know, who made it? Um, where was it made? You know, was the person who made it, were they, were they paid a living wage? Uh, was it made sustainably? Was it, is it something that was shipped you know, from 2,000 miles away or from across the globe, or was it something that was made by, you know, within my local community? That kind of, of story behind the product is, uh, is, is something that um, uh, you know, people are, are, seem to be valuing more, and a lot of the good retailers, they get that, and they're, they're emphasizing that. Um, you know, the purchase of a product is becoming more, of, you know, it's, it's not just about the product, it's more like, what does my purchase of this product say about me and my values? And companies like, uh, like Apple, uh, American Apparel, uh, Timberland, Anthropology, and uh, even the ubiquitous Starbucks are companies that really understand this. And uh, they're, you know, those are going to be, I think, the trends that are going to pull us out of, uh, of where we've been um, or where we are now. You know, there's going to be also a lot of emphasis on, you know, for me, again, converting those old big box spaces into the uses that are successful now, and a lot of them are non-traditional for malls. Um, grocery, uh, 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 fitness, um, theaters. Theaters have been an important piece, but, you know, theaters actually have had uh, the best year in a long time last year. The, the theory was always that, theories were, or that theaters were recession-proof, and that seems to have proven itself to be true. Last year, they were up 10% over 2008. They crossed a $10 billion in, in domestic box office ticket sales last year, and, and they had their best attendance since 2004. So uh, bringing that into the mall um, is something that, that uh, you know, it adds a, a night, nighttime element. It, it brings more life and, and better utilization of your real estate. So, uh, so my job is now going to be more about how do I bring those non-traditional uses back into the mall and, and add more diversity of use into the mall. And, Luckily, it's not an easy thing. Taking a department store box and putting in a health club or a grocery store or a theater is not a simple thing. Um, so, uh, so luckily, for now at least, uh, I'm still employed and I still have some, some good prospects. But uh, it is going to be different. Uh, you know, the days of the, you know, the 500 or 700,000 square foot expansion to a shopping center are, are gone for a while. I don't know if and when they'll come back, but I don't expect it to be soon. And, and just out of curiosity, how many new malls will Westfield uh, start in 2010? Well, Westfield actually, in the U.S. anyway, doesn't do new malls. We never have. We've always been a purchaser of existing assets and then probably the most active redeveloper. Um, we've done a lot of that over the years. Plaza Bonita here in National City is our most recent San Diego example where we took an old department store box, put in a, a Target a discounter and a theater, an AMC theater, um, and expanded a, a little bit of shops. But uh, in terms of major projects, you know, that was a $120 million project. Projects of that scale are going to be less. It's going to be, um, you know, smaller, more focused projects. And, and I don't know if you can share anything publicly, but what's your, uh, what's your expectation of uh, the fallout from the general growth bankruptcy? Uh, you're right. I can't share anything publicly. <laughs> I, I should, preface, should have prefaced my remarks by saying that unlike my other panelists up here, uh, I'm not the CEO. I'm, in fact, a long way from the CEO of Westfield. Uh, so uh, anything that I said here, anything that came out of my mouth is not an official statement. <laughs> um, uh, you know, you, and hopefully not my last statement. <laughs> yeah, hopefully not my last statement. So, 
<laughs> uh, all right, well, Dean, Dean Oliver's been waiting very patiently, and uh, he's cautioned me that, uh, you know, he, he may be forced to use uh, colorful language similar to Sam Zell's, and so I'm going to issue a disclaimer in advance of Dean's remarks. <laughs> You know, they have my mic turned off. <laughs> I, th I think they have it on a pause, right? You've got that button up there, I've Brad. The, I've got the you know, 10 seconds This is the first time I've ever been the last. Where's Mark Reedy? I want to thank you for inviting me to be the last person, Mark, that you invited <laughs> to the panel and then having me be the last to speak and, and have it be prefaced by the fact that one of the, uh, one of the brighter guys in our industry uh, defined uh, us and me uh, upon uh, his talk as the poster child for functional obsolescence for the next five years. And that was really a great way to walk in the room. And I was thinking, you know, he's probably right in a lot of big ways, but I'm gonna find little places to wiggle in between um, what he and some others had to say. And I, and I was thinking about longevity, uh, and Stephen Rulak um, was responsible for helping to create Oliver McMillan, uh, because Jim McMillan and I sat in his class at, at UC Berkeley when we were 20 years old uh, in the early 70s. Um, so I think that one of the reasons that we're still alive today is that we were able to absorb about 4.75% of what he had to teach us. <laughs> so Stephen, thank you for that and uh, uh, for all the great things you did teach us that we, that we took forward. I I'm gonna take a little different shot here and say we're the only people up here today that are a boutique development firm. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit sort of about the psycho-emotional experience of being a boutique development firm and, and what we went through, how we got through it, and where we're going now. Um, first off, I have a few circled words here in my, in my text that was going to be a few minutes longer. Uh, starting with December 07, the, the words that come to the top of my mind coming back from Sun Valley, Idaho, were words like fear and dread. Um, uh, certainly, you heard the word panic today. Uh, that probably didn't happen uh, until the fall. Uh, summer uh, of 08 was, was certainly, you know, a great place to, to, from the commercial side to be in denial that it, that it was only going to be about the subprime. It couldn't possibly be about the commercial world because cap rates were where they were, there was all this money, and there was just no way it was going to spill over. Then the fall for all of us, I, I don't know a better word than panic, uh, maybe shock and awe that we heard about a few years back. Uh, and by the fourth quarter, um, in the period that you know, we now dub post-Lehman, you know, can you imagine being Dick Fold? There was before Christ, BC, AD, and then there's PL, post-Lehman, and uh, post-Lehman Fold. I, I, what, a, what a legacy. Um, so really the question for us was, how did a firm that had a development pipeline of about $1.5 billion going on in mixed-use projects in great urban markets from Chicago West uh, survive? Um, one of the ways that we survived was that we had about a 3.5 million square foot portfolio, and a big chunk of what we had done were urban apartments. Um, uh, unlike Sam Zell, who owns South America, we uh, have large influence over the downtown urban luxury apartment market, uh, and that's proved to be a great move as opposed to using those resources for condominiums. The other great news for us was all of our failures. Our failures to get monster projects under construction sooner. We had a $700 million project in Houston, Texas, in the Beverly Hills of Houston with the W Hotel, which is one of the hotels that, uh, if Sam were still here, I would tell you, I think there is a sexual orientation. Um, and uh, we had a Blame Meridian Hotel, and then it was full of luxury retail. Um, $700 million projects, it doesn't matter who you are, just aren't going to be done for the foreseeable future. So the good news for us and our partners was that we did not break ground on a lot of the things that we had been working on. Uh, so we are still holding about 250 great urban acres of land ready for either Sam's five-year period or our period that will be varying market by market depending on, on the niche. Um, what did we do? We immediately jumped in to get all those projects on hold, stabilized, unfortunately, all of those that are architects that are out here, contractors, et cetera. We impacted your business with those decisions, and that was a horrible thing to do. 
uh, was tough. Uh, it felt bad. Um, we had to do the same thing inside our shop and, and do some cuts because we put a lot of projects on hold. And we cut a little deeper than we probably needed to, but we really wanted to try and only do it once. Uh, interestingly, by the end of last year, uh, our staff was back up to about 80 people. Um, so it was actually bigger than when we started this, the, the, the cuts. Um, but the real thing that we did and that we're continuing to do is to focus on relationships. I, I can't tell you that there's anything that's more important in this business, and, and I'm not meaning uh, via social networking. Uh, and I have young girls, in fact, uh, mine are young enough that I could go to medical school and they would only be 16 and 17 when I was done. Uh, I'm going to go home tonight and talk to them about it and maybe I'll go with them. <laughs> uh, but anyway, relationships, relationships, relationships. There is nothing that is more important. That is, that, that is the kind of business that we're in. Absolutely, in terms of stabilizing our existing portfolio, it's our relationship with our banks. Uh, we were out there, we were talking to everybody, we were working on issues if we did have them. Fortunately, we did not have a lot of loans that were rolling. We had assets, for the most part, that were cash flowing. One CMBS that were actually, uh, looks like we're going to renegotiate, but we're not getting, asking for a pay down, or excuse me, a reduction in principle, and we're putting money in the deal. Uh, Bank of America, uh, through ups and downs and everything they've been through, have been rock solid partners for Oliver McMillan. Our other critical relationships have been our three tranches of our equity partners. And those have been uh, private equity. Uh, they've been institutions such as Principal Financial. One of our biggest investors is, again, Principal Financial. They've been steady. They've been solid. They've had their own hits. But they're making good decisions rather than bad decisions, one of the smart things we did in this last market. And strong uh, private equity sources such as Baupost uh, out of Boston. So we are talking to those people nonstop. The other place our relationships are pivotal are with the cities. Um, we are big on public-private partnerships. I think they're going to have a lot to do with coming back out the other side. Uh, municipalities uh, are like entrepreneurs. There are some that are good. There are some that are not. They're going to have a lot to do with when the music turns back on and the spigots open up, what projects happen first. And I'm going to say, there's not going to be more uh, malls because people don't, that's not really where they want to go. That is not where we are moving as a society. Uh, I hated the notion and spoke about it regularly uh, at conferences of a lifestyle center. Uh, anytime a concept gets to where you can wrap it up, put a bow around it, and institutionalize it at ULI or ICSE, it's ready for failure. Whether it was lifestyle centers or urban entertainment centers, every one of them that they've defined has failed. You know, if you want to go back and look at what's sustainable, you go back and look at the great cities of the world uh, from Western civilization and come this direction. Uh, starting with New York. That's what's sustainable. And we are at a point now where we don't have a lot of land. And you talk about what Steve Rulak spoke about today, the desirable places where people want to live. Those areas are all running out of land. It's going to be about redevelopment and reharvesting to create that life on the street that, that people want to see. So very much focused on the city. The other big place is our culture inside our organization, really focusing on that. We've all been in a period of, let's face it, fearfulness. Who's going to lose their job? Who's going to say the wrong thing? Who's going to make the wrong move? Who suddenly is someone that can be let go? Um, so there's so much fear that um, we, um, we really focused a lot of time on our culture. So I'll take two seconds and tell you what we've been doing. Contrary to statements that have been made today, there is still development going on. Uh, we are underway uh, by combining new construction with a broken deal. We bought a 27-story stopped condominium project in Honolulu. We're unlike San Diego. There's no overhang. We bought it for 30 cents on the dollar. We're doing the buyout of the balance of the construction for about 70 cents on the dollar. It's $150 million in cost. A sale out of about $275 million. Is it financeable? Here's the, here's the model. $100 million of equity and $50 million worth of debt. Now, by the way, that debt is being done on a non-recourse basis uh, at uh, LIBOR plus about 350 basis points. Um, but it's one-third of the cost of the job that we're buying out at probably 60 cents on the dollar. 
Um, now, that came from going in and buying a lien by a contractor, teeing up a foreclosure, buying the residual fee, uh, so we didn't have other firms come in and overbid us on the foreclosure. It was very complicated, but it's a niche. Um, and so, Dean, what's the source of the equity on a deal like that? Uh, it was 6% um, from Oliver McMillan, and it was 94% uh, from uh, Balpost, who is a regular partner of ours. Now, again, that's something else I'm going to say, and I'm not a doom and gloom guy. I'm, I'm, a, I'm an absolute optimist. Um, going forward in the development world, unless you have those capital relationships with banks and equity partners, they are not going to be easy to put together. So for those that want to try and start as students, you know, you need to get into a firm where there's that activity, develop those relationships, and hopefully transfer them out at some time. But the Hawaii story is part of a niche, and, and how do you differentiate yourself and create relevance? It is not in a firm like ours by doing financial engineering and joining uh, the, the throngs of people going out and bidding on projects. Uh, we did that and, and were consistently 30 out of 35, 40 out of 45, and I congratulated our crew for, um, for their prudence. So as we've always done in our 30 some odd year history, it's always been niches. It's always been things that have been more complicated. Today, it's things where we can take our platform, where things are severely broken, uh, and we can come in and add value, whether it's a JV with a bank, uh, or whether it's coming back in and taking others out. Um, just another story over in my uh, thoughts about public-private partnerships. We're breaking ground this year on about uh, $75, $80 million worth of work in Iowa City, Coralville. We're building a 200,000 square foot fully pre-leased medical office building, bond finance with the University of Iowa, a Von Mar department store, the Nordstrom's of Iowa shops, and um, some long-term stay hotel rooms above it. Uh, again, a lot of bond financing, huge amounts of subsidy from that municipality who says, this is a bad time, we understand it, we're going to step up, we still have plans for our city, um, and there will be others like that. Um, we've helped put together, some of you may have read about the new car that's being developed out of San Diego and will be manufactured uh, in Louisiana, and we helped put together the public-private partnership there, um, and the, the equity all came from Kleiner Perkins and then some new Fed funding, but we're actually overseeing building an automobile factory in Louisiana. So that and um, uh, public-private partnership work, um, you know, that's probably enough for me. I, I think that as we have always thought, I continue to believe it's going to be about urban redevelopment. I continue to believe we're going to be living in smaller spaces. Uh, I continue to believe we need to spend less time in the car. I continue to believe there's going to be good opportunities and there will be niches. So I'm one to say that there will be development in the next five years and we're doing some right now. Terrific. Thank you. Um, I'd love to get some questions uh, out of the audience. Uh, and there are microphones, I think, as you know. Uh, anybody uh, have something for one of these gentlemen? I've got a suggestion. Yeah. I was going to suggest, uh, Dean, if you, if you are thinking about medical school, um, I, I would, would you consider, uh, I would <laughs> consider psychiatry or brain surgery, because judging on some of the commercial real estate loans uh, I've seen in the last couple of years, there were a lot of people need their head examined. Brad, I, I, I've long thought that to be involved in this business, you had to be a lobotomy recovery patient. So any of you who want a sane profession, change it. Uh, it's, it's not this industry. Um, but, you know, I, I think the things that we're looking at right now, we're really counting on the fact that when we, when we are going vertical, that, that we will have probably a 50% equity position in deals. So I, I think the underwriting is going to be tougher. One of the tough things about getting new development going is that we watched from, if you took 03 to 07, we were underwriting our projects looking for 12.5% returns on cost. Um, and that dropped as, as more capital became available and things got heated up to where we were looking at building urban apartments. If we could get a 6% return on cost, we were doing well, which meant we had to sell it at a five cap rate to, to have it work. Now, construction costs have come down, but they haven't come down enough. And rents aren't going up, they're going down. 
So when you come back and look at those metrics and say at the same time you're going to have to look at higher returns on cost to attract the capital, uh, the, the, the model for development without some subsidies and public-private partnerships is going to be very, very tough. You know, I agree with everything that's been said. Um, thank God for apartments um, and apartments in the context of mixed use. Let me ask the group uh, to comment on Sam Zell's statement. This relates to existing assets that are, that are underwater, and in some cases substantially underwater, uh, that dilution is the solution, and that uh, uh, current borrowers should stay involved and loans get uh, uh, written down to, to uh, more reasonable levels. Do you, have a, do you have a view on, on, uh, on that bill? Because you're seeing uh, a lot of product uh, that you're having to step in on as a receiver. Well, I guess uh, part of that is how you define the dilution. I don't, I don't see people taking down buildings, but we're certainly seeing a lot of things close up, uh, particularly if it's uh, one minute prior to finishing the project. Uh, I, I think this year, I'll, I'll go back to hotels again, I think this year, um, we will see not only tremendous discounts, uh, I think you will actually see some hotels close. Um, there, some of them are so close to it, they might as well. Um, and, uh, you know, interested people in hotels, there are a number of opportunities in San Diego available. Um, and a couple of those you probably know about, I won't mention specifically, but it's, it's the same kind of, it indicates the same thing that we're seeing in that probably close to half of the properties that we get to serve as receiver on are, are being handed back to the lender or, uh, or, or cooperatively that's, handed back. That, One that's, of our I, I hope there are hotels that happen to It's a great place to put the chronic homeless. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Brad, I think what uh, people forget about the real estate business is that it does require capital to build value or to keep your cash flow. And although this dilution theory may be, you know, something I, I think uh, that Sam has brought out, I, I do think what people forget out there is the fact that in order to keep a property going and sustain your cash flow or build your cash flow, you do need a lot, of ca you need capital in all sectors. So if you can't get capital or in terms of running the property, then in my view, what will continue to happen is the value, no matter what takes place, will continue to go down. One of the big advantages, in my view, REITs have today, or certainly well-capitalized companies have today, is that in the retail business, we're able to lease because a tenant can't go anywhere else. So I think one of the things to remember is that this is a capital-intensive business, and as a capital-intensive business, the banks can sit there with the borrower, but if they're not giving them capital, I think they're just going to continue to go yeah. the other well, way. Well, that's where it goes back to the issue of all the relationships. Yep. Right. Where's the, where's, the, uh, where's the money going? I mean, for quite some time now, we've had a, a consistent stream of phone calls to our office from opportunity funds who have raised X dollars. It's usually $500 million for some reason. <laughs> um, and I'll usually ask them, the, you know, right off the bat, I'll say, what have you, what have you bought in the last six months, nine months? The answer is usually nothing. Uh, we're waiting for the better opportunity. We're waiting for the bottom or when we feel we're near the bottom. So I'm assuming there is a lot of money out there just, just waiting for opportunities. Yeah, there, there is a lot of money. As you're articulating, that money, though, ha the return expectations for that, for those dollars, are very high. But they so, will, don't you think, Stuart, with time, because of the pent up demand for the product to get the money into, that with time, those relative rates of return expectations will diminish. Absolutely, no question right. about that. And, and, and what, about, what about the notion that the underwriting and the due diligence uh, and the supply and demand analysis, on the other hand, is they're diminishing, will probably be stronger than ever? Yeah. I think in some cases, uh, it would almost have to be stronger because it couldn't be too much weaker. Uh, than it was. <laughs> Particularly in CMBS, where you know you've got a wide collection of properties, and it doesn't appear to us that um, all or even a majority of those properties were really even looked at by somebody who uh, understood the value of a property. And, and a good deal of your business, as I understand it, Bill, now is from the special servicers, uh, CMBS uh, holders. And you mentioned uh, in, your, in your remarks that there has been a change in the law that allows uh, 
those uh, special servicers to actually facilitate taking back paper in a sale. Uh, and how much do you think that's going to increase the velocity of, uh, of transactions in the coming year? Obviously, there were no transactions or very few that were done last year. Well, I what think we'll see it in apartments first. In apartments, it will have a dramatic effect. We've seen some of those already. I mean, we actually have some apartments that are selling uh, versus most other real estate uh, okay. that we're not. And another change, the, I think, Bill, there's see. lines for there's lines to buy apartments. If apartment mm -hmm. product goes out, mm -hmm. and there's 30, 40 bidders. There, there's a, a, pro, a project in downtown San Diego that's about to move right now with some moderate income restricted units, and it's going to go at a mid five cap. Um, with people standing in line to get it. So apartments are such an anomaly. Uh, I think uh, Tishman Spire was a little early on the, uh, some low-income housing being converted in New York. It was a tough <laughs> five and a half billion or, or, or whatever it was. Uh, the, other th the other thing we're seeing that uh, is different just specifically in our own business uh, is, is that uh, special servicers on CMBS loans for the most part, I think over the next year, you'll see, are never taking properties to foreclosure. They will, I've, I've been told by some of, the, some of the larger special servicers have said, Bill, no matter how long it takes, you're going to sell that property from receivership. We are, not, we are never going into title on that property. And that, that is becoming prevalent at this stage. And, and part, of that, uh, part of that, initially when uh, we got involved in that, part of it, I think, was just to be early to the market. Um, on, on, the, uh, on the belief that it's going to get worse tomorrow and for quite a few tomorrows. Uh, but their being able to provide financing uh, is a big plus. Right now we're seeing, um, I would say it's probably about a 20% premium on the price if there's financing available. And, and the financing, almost all the financing I'm seeing are modified CMBS loans. Time for uh, a question? Yeah. Great. This might be for Dean, but for anybody, I was, wanted to know what additional complications, if any, you're finding in financing a mixed-use project versus a single-use project? I, I think everything's difficult to finance for a while. I think one of the things that, that we're experiencing right now, and, and uh, you know, I want to go back to the whole special servicer thing, I'm going to make a prognostication right now that the sheets are going to be pulled back on a lot of the special servicers who are right now being viewed as the smartest people in the world, and they're the next group of the non-smartest people in the, world, in the room. <laughs> Um, and so I think that is going to be completely shaken up this year uh, as well, because right now um, they're, uh, they're being viewed somewhat uh, as the end-all intellectual clearinghouse, and, and, and I don't see it. Um, one thing with mixed-use projects, as the markets heated up, we were able to finance construction loans for an entire project. And then on a takeout basis, we could take the second level of apartments and put that into one loan and the retail below in another and the office stack somewhere else in another. I, I think the CMBS folks are going to learn um, some lessons that that's probably a tough thing to do on those assets where there's been trouble with performance. Uh, I think mixed-use projects have always been hard to finance um, and I think they'll continue to be hard to finance, but they're complicated projects and they always will be complicated and it's going to take it's going to be a certain sector of the market that's going to be able to do them, and I'm talking about vertically stacked uses as opposed to multi-use sitting in the same project. So I think it's going to continue to be tough, and I think the CMBS rules, uh, as they're coming back with, with what they're doing on mixed use, is going to be uh, greatly altered. Because if you end up in a situation with, with apartments with one lender and retail on another, as we have in Chicago, it gives us great leverage in working with that special servicer, which we're doing right now. You know, a lot of times things are painted with a broad brush, and I think uh, people run as a result uh, of overgeneralization. And, and uh, uh, Dean, in particular, you're involved in a lot of different cities across, uh, across the country, a lot of different product types. And I'm just wondering what yours and, and you know, Greg and Bill and Stuart chime in here too, but what your view of the prospects for downtown San Diego and, and San Diego overall are 
both kind of in the, uh, in the intermediate term and, and in the long term? I, I think it goes back to quality of life. And there is no question that the quality of life in downtown San Diego is high. It's getting higher all the time. The population is projected to get to 100,000 people. Uh, I think some of the first starts you're going to see again will be some urban apartments in downtown San Diego. I think there's room for more retail and some services uh, in downtown San Diego. So I think it'll be probably the first place you really start to see some recovery uh, in, in construction uh, in, in San Diego County. But I just think overall, and I, I think others have emphasized it, that it doesn't matter whether you're talking about downtown San Diego or anything else you're doing in this business right now. It's all about your niche. And what are you bringing to the table that's different than somebody else? And how are you creating your niche? And if you're not thinking that way, your chances of being here next year aren't great. And I would agree that I think downtown San Diego is probably one of the first. It was, it was the first one on the way up. And it was also the first one, I think, you know, it was on the leading edge on the way down, and I think it'll probably be, a, you know, be on the first, uh, the front edge on the way back up. But, you know, CCDC and the city of San Diego have, have had, uh, you know, had their, had their troubles, but I think fundamentally they still um, are, are good and they believe in, and they understand how to continue to improve uh, the downtown area. And by the way, bringing the Chargers downtown and getting that deal done, I think Jerry Sanders is going to have the courage to do it. He's not going to run for another office. And I think what it can do for downtown in a recovery will be huge, just like what happened with the Padres. So uh, when you guys go to vote, since you're in this industry, put your hands up loud uh, on the stadium, whether you like the Chargers or go to football games or not. Uh, I'm going to have to, uh, I'm, I'm going to defer to people who know much more about that than I do. I'm, but, I'm on a different By the way, that. Greg, um, what about opening up uh, Horton Plaza? There were great plans for that that had begun. Uh, taking some residential back in it, taking our edge along 4th Avenue and opening it back up and, and really opening Horton Plaza with the boundaries out back to downtown. I think that's going to be huge ultimately. What, what's, what's the plans with that? Yeah, you know, I think long term that, uh, that still is the vision. Um, you know, Horton Plaza, you know, was an amazing piece of the whole revitalization of downtown San Diego. Um, you know, it opened in 85 and it was a phenomenon, right. but when it was built, it had to be a fortress. It had to basically keep the ugliness of downtown away and it drew people in and it helped kick off and now it's kind of a victim of its own success right. because w that fortress we, that was necessary at the time now you want to open it back up and it's just since, uh, since we own that, that building that keeps you from doing that we're really anxious for you to move <laughs> that ahead of your relative priorities so yeah. you know if you have like a wish list and stuff while you're still there <laughs> put that one as long as you don't mind us blowing right through uh, you no, know, F Street and you can come building, you, no no absolutely I'm happy for you to blow my building right in half right in the middle <laughs> and uh, Spartan Plaza is a great example of my knowledge of development when that was going up, I thought, that's the dumbest idea I ever heard of. <laughs> <laughs> Proved to be a great catalyst. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, Brad, what about your project? <laughs> You're yeah, the I'm, moderator. Dean, I'm the moderator. I know. I get to you know, ask it's getting late, and you asked me last, and, and I didn't say the F word the whole time. So, it, it, <laughs> and, and I'm so, getting the cane over So there. Yeah, you didn't yeah, say the F word. No, I did. Yeah, <laughs> right. Thanks. When I get to be as old as Sam Zell, I will. Um, so, Brad, what about, what about your project? It, Brad was working on a great project to bring some big box uh, to, to downtown, and I think uh, it's an important and, project. And, and still are. Um, this is a, a six-acre project called Metro Center, which is just south of the uh, MTS headquarters building. And uh, our plan was and still is uh, to do uh, vertical big box retail there uh, to address uh, an underserved uh, niche in the downtown area. Uh, and quite frankly, in a greater kind of sub-market in San Diego. Right. Uh, and, you know, quite frankly, the economics today of doing those big box deals don't make sense. Right. But we don't have any debt, and we have the luxury of being able to wait until such time as the, uh, uh, the world improves. And whether that's next year or three years from now, you know, I don't know. But, uh, you know, we continue to be committed to, to do that, and I think it serves a... Uh, it will serve a, a great use uh, for uh, for downtown and for Coronado, uh, you know, quite frankly. So. Thanks for letting me ask you questions. That <laughs> well, that's all we have, uh, have time for. I want to thank our panelists, uh, and I also, <laughs> since, since we're the last panel, I, I do want to, uh, I want to thank all of the sponsors for today's event. Uh, and also put a little plug in for the Burnham Morris Center. 
um, and and uh, and show some appreciation for all of you for being here because uh, it's conferences like this that help uh, sustain the program that and private donations and uh, as you know in addition to uh, offering a first-rate academic program uh, in the real estate field the Burnham Moore Center also is is the bridge uh, between uh, the University of San Diego and uh, the real estate community and uh, I know Mark and and, uh, and the rest of us involved uh, at Burnham Moores are thrilled with the turnout uh, today and we hope all of you will continue to uh, stay involved and stay connected. Uh, I'm going to turn it back over to, to Mark for for a drawing so you don't want to leave yet. No, I don't want to, I don't want to be shown as biased so oh, I'm going to shake it up a little bit. And I'm sorry, Dean. I'm sorry we put you on. Sorry we put you on last, but you did a great job. You're, you're so, he needs continuing education, right? There's some medical school cards in here already. All right, grow one in. You don't have to be present to win. From Wells Fargo, Brett Kondrick, who was a Woodruff Scholarship winner in the past, so maybe he needs CE, maybe he doesn't. Brett, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Uh, there is prepaid parking that you can pick up on the way out. It might speed your way out of the parking lot unless you want to stick around and talk. Thanks again for being here.